Hi, this is Calculus Section 2.2 Notes. This will be Day 2. Uh, we did Day 1 already, and so this is Day 2. Arbitrary point problem we'll do in class, and then we want to find the derivative of sine and cosine, average rate of change, average velocity, and then the instantaneous velocity. So we're getting into more applications of the derivatives. Uh, going back over the notes from last time, this was a mistake, and so I need to fix that up. And so this should be a zero. I probably said zero and I wrote it wrong. Then if I go to day two, second page, in class, we did the, uh, talked about Madrid and local linearity. And so now what we want to do is get the derivative of the sine. Oh, the derivative of sine is a cosine. We did a introductory activity that showed us the derivative of the sine is the cosine. And now we can say that the derivative of the cosine is negative sine. Uh, let's look at the graph first. So if I take the y equals sine, so the sine, here the slope looks like it'd probably be about 1. And then here the slope is 0. Here the slope is negative 1. Here's the slope is 0. And then positive 1 again. So if I draw the derivative of this, I can go on. And then here's where I start at 1. That's what I said the derivative looked like it was here. And then here the slope seems to be 0. Sure enough, there's my 0. Now I'm going to be decreasing. So now my graph goes down below the x-axis because I have negative values. This is a negative slope. I'm going to go back up to 0 when I get to here. And then I'm going to be positive again. What does this dotted graph look like? Well, sure enough, it looks like the cosine graph. And if I do this again with the cosine graph and take the derivative, slope starts at 0, goes to negative 1. We'll go to 0. Ah, looks like the negative sine. And so that's what happens. They're just kind of cyclical on how they go around. It's a pattern of 4, which we can talk about later. But if I want to do the... Um, proof on this, I can, and it takes some things that we've been doing already. So if I take the derivative of the sine and prove that this is equal to the cosine, what I want to do is I know that the derivative, uh, first of all, let's let f of x equal the sine of x. And then I have f prime is equal to the limit as x, I'm sorry, as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So if I use this sine function in there, this would be the limit as h goes to 0, sine of x plus h minus the sine of x all over h. And if you remember your trig sum identities, some angle identities, this would be the sine of x times the cosine of h, and then plus the sine of h cosine of x minus the sine of x all over h. And then I got to put these things together here a little bit. So I'm going to group these sine of x. These two terms have the sine of x, so I'm going to pull that out. Cosine of h minus 1, and then I have the plus the sine of h times the cosine of x, and I can take this h and distribute, I guess you could say, amongst both of these. And so if I look at this one, this limit as h goes to 0, this is my special trig limit. And so this will overall equal... 0 times the sine of x. And then this one would be 1. The derivative is h goes to 0 sine of h over h is 1. And then times the cosine of x. So that is equal to the cosine x. That's what we were looking for. In your homework, you'll have to prove the derivative of the cosine of x. So let's apply some of these rules. Uh, remember, this is a constant multiple. It goes along for the ride. So the 2 just goes along for the ride. The derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. Finished. 
This one is a coefficient of one third. So if you wish, you could write it like this. Derivative of the cosine is negative sine. So I'd get negative one third sine of x. If I go to the next one, these are pieces. So I do one piece at a time. Y prime is equal to, this is one half x cubed. So I'm going to bring the three out in front raise it to the one less power, and then I'm going to take the derivative here. The derivative of the cosine, we said, was negative sine. So I'm going to end up with positive sine of x. There you go. Those are my derivatives. Moving on, we have average rate of change. When we talk about average rate of change, average rate of change is the slope of the secant. So if I look at this stock of Johnson & Johnson, I like using the stock examples, and I start down here at approximately $40 in 2000, um, I guess it says 1998. But here, my example says 2000 to 2008. So let's figure out where this is. Oh, same value, so that's good. And then I end up here about 70. The average rate of change would be the slope of this secant line. I didn't draw that very straight, but in fact, let me do it again. That's a better line. Now I want to find the slope of this and figure out what does it mean. So I have 70 and 40. So it's um, 70 minus 40. And I did this over, I guess this isn't exactly uh, the right dates. January 2008 would have been right here. And that works about to be 70 anyways. So then I'd end up with eight years. And so I get 30 over 8. And if I simplify that, so I get 3.75. What does that mean? Well, what did I divide? I divided my price divided by my years. So this is going to be dollars per year. And in the context of this problem, what does that mean? Does that mean that, well, if you look at this 8-year period, What's going to happen is that I'm going to end up with, on average, I'm going to increase by three dollars and seventy-five percent. Excuse me, three dollars and seventy-five cents per year. This is my average rate of change. An average rate of change goes from a starting point on the interval to an ending point on the interval. And so, when we talk about a rate of change, we're also doing that. Well. In this case, it's just the stock price, but we can also apply it to physics problems. And so if I do average velocity, average velocity would be the slope of the secant of the position function, where wherever the position of whatever particle or whatever you're looking at is. And then instantaneous velocity would be the slope of the tangent. Notice the difference in the words. Average velocity would be slope of the secant line. And then instantaneous velocity is the slope of the tangent. So let's use one of these examples and see what happens. Our general equation of the gravity flight would be position function. This is the height off the ground. G is your um, acceleration due to gravity. V naught is your initial velocity going, well, if it's positive, it's going up. And then S naught would be your initial position or your initial height. So if I have a position function here, it looks like I'm using feet because I have negative 16, which is one half of the 32, which I have there. My initial velocity, it looks like I threw the ball up at 25 feet per second, and then 100 is the feet. So I can read that all out of my equation. First of all, it says, what's the average velocity? So it says average velocity, so that would be my secant slope. So in doing this, I need two points. And so if I get two points from this, this is an interval. So this means that x is an element of that. So x has to be a 1, and then it has to be a 2. Those are the endpoints of my interval. So to get two points, I need to plug in 1 and 2 into my equation. The values that I got at 1, the height would be 109. And then at 2, it would be 86. So what I want to do is to find the average velocity would just be to find the slope between these two points. So average 
velocity is equal to, and it doesn't matter which way you go here, just be consistent, 109 minus 86. I took this one first, this one second, so then I go 1 minus 2. So 80, uh, 109 minus 86 would be 23. And that would be positive, and then my denominator would be a negative 1, so overall it would be negative. So my average velocity on that interval would be decreasing, and then this would be units, would be feet per second, because that's what I divided, feet divided by second. So now if we look at instantaneous velocity, instantaneous velocity, now we need to do the slope of the tangent. And to get the slope of the tangent, we need the derivative. So if I take the derivative of the position function, that is equal to the velocity function. So if I do that, that would be negative 32t plus 25. And then the derivative of 100 would be 0. So now this is my velocity function. And if I want the instantaneous velocity at 1.3, all I have to do is put in 1.3 and I'll get negative 32, 1.3 plus 25. Maybe put that into your calculator and see what you get. Negative 32 times 1.3 plus 25. I got negative 16.6. What units do I put on this? Because I don't see any division here and such. Well, when I do the derivative, built into that process would be dividing by the seconds as we did above. So this would be your position function divided by seconds. So I get negative 16.6 feet per second. That means I'm decre decreasing at that time as well. All right, so in class, you'll be going through some of the problems for this section and um, using the derivative of the sine and cosine and also looking at some different uh, ways that we look at velocity with the average velocity and instantaneous velocity, which would be also considered average rate of change. And I guess you could say instantaneous rate of change, which would be the slope of the tangent. All right. Thank you very much.